Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarin Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller, host of the Stoller Report and host of the AmTrust Title Insurance Webinar Series, Steve Napolitano, Senior Executive Vice President. Today, we have a group of wonderful female executives in the real estate business who are going to provide their views on the state of the market today and where they see the state of the market later on in the year in 2021. I'd like each and every one of them to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what they're doing so we can gain some insight. Hi, I'm Robin Topol. I'm a partner at Meister, Seelig & Fine, a full-service law firm in New York with offices in Connecticut, New Jersey, and California. I specialize in commercial real estate, primarily office and retail leasing. I, um, I handle financings, acquisitions, 1031 exchanges. In the past, I've been named one of the top real estate attorneys in metropolitan New York for the last eight years and one of the top women lawyers. My clients consist of national uh, landlords with buildings of, in excess of local New York landlords, as well as some Connecticut landlords with retail and office buildings. The tenants that I represent are national tenants, local tenants, restaurants, retail stores, and medical offices. Uh, early on, I had some bankruptcy practice, and which has been proving very helpful lately as I'm working with a lot of landlords whose tenants are filing for bankruptcy. I serve on a few national uh, not-for-profit boards, and I've served on my town planning board and architectural review board. Thank you. Carrie. Thank you, Michael, and the AmTrust team for uh, inviting me to join this esteemed group. Um, I'm Carrie Gamula. I'm president of MMDC Group, a real estate advisory firm focused on sustainability. Um, as well as doing uh, workouts and restructurings. Um, I was with Citigroup for nearly a decade doing workouts with their community development group and have worked in acquisitions, advisory, asset management, investment sales. Um, I'm also involved on several nonprofit boards um, in various capacities. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Carrie. Hi, my name's Carrie, Carolyn Piannon. I am a senior vice president at Arcturus Group. We are a New York-based asset management and advisory firm focused on uh, helping high net worth individuals and institutional clients in crises. We have um, managed over 15 billion of assets during during the past decade. Um, we are our clients are across all asset types everywhere in the capital stack. 
Right now we are currently focused on dealing with retailers that are struggling and helping them renegotiate land, uh, their leases with landlords. We are working with hospitality firms, helping them focus on optimizing uh, revenue as well as look taking a deep dive into their operational expenses. And we are working with lenders that are um, trying to deal with their borrowers that are also struggling. So we have kind of a unique perspective because all, all of our senior team has backgrounds, uh, strong backgrounds in their sector. And um, we are working across the country, helping all different types of um, clients in, in crisis modes. Larissa. Thank you, Michael and the Amtrust team. Uh, my name is Larissa Belova. I am with TBRE Global Investors. We're a uh, global real estate investment manager uh, with 106 billion of AUM. I work in our American business and I'm the deputy portfolio manager for flagship core open end funds. Um, currently, we are working on um, identifying interesting opportunities for the future, as well as certainly working across asset classes in this very challenging situation. Uh, that we're all in. So look forward to uh, sharing some perspectives today. So listening to everyone, you have four different, you know, different asset classes that we all have. Which one do you believe is the one that's the hardest today and the hardest that's going to, to recover over the next six to 12 months? Larissa, you're, you're the one who's buying, okay? Retail, you think, or hospitality? Yeah, retail is uh, certainly going to, well, it's already been kind of going out of favor as an asset class. I think that it has some systemic challenges in the United States overall and uh, has been hit with even further challenges. Now kind of digging itself out of a hole will be interesting. It will be um, interesting to see how tenants will reimagine their use of their space, how they'll run their business in the new e-commerce way, and um, certainly uh, probably in a worse shape than hospitality. I think hospitality is probably more of a, um, it's a, it's a disruption, but once, once things are back and the vaccine is back, um, things will improve. I'd like to comment on what Larissa said. I believe actually that um, hospitality is hit harder. I think I think what happened in retail was already happening in retail and, and COVID was an accelerator. I think what happened to the hospitality uh, industry was really just like lightning strike right out of the blue. Um, you know, right after the, the great, during the great financial crisis, occupancy in the hospitality interest industry went down 10%. Occupancies were hit by COVID and went down three times that. And, and I think the prognosis is so much worse for the hospitality industry because re what's happening in retail, people are going to go shopping, but you can't make up that lost income from not being able to travel. And I think without a medical solution, you're not going to see conferences come back. You're not going to see conventions come back. You're not, you know, with the impact of the ability to have a Zoom call, People may choose to do that instead of getting on an airplane and travel. And I think hospitality just has so much of a longer recovery. Terry, you, you've been involved with hospitality when you were at City. How do you see hospitality? I think it's got a bit of a road to get up. Um, I think that it's it's always the first to go. It's a it's a, because you have to sell a room every night. You have a real time indicator on how the economy is doing, and so it's usually the first to go in. It's usually the first to come out. Um, I think that if with masks, and I know that, um, but masks have been proven to really slow the spread of this. If you go to Japan, they stayed open. They did not shut down. People wear masks everywhere there, and they seem to be dealing with it much better. So I think that if you can get into a, an environment where masks and spacing help with it, I think you might start to see the hospitality come back. Because I know me, I'm already looking at travel deals. I'm ready to go back. I just would want to choose a room that has an operable window. That, that to me, is the bigger challenge, is, the opera, is getting the enough fresh air and ventilation in to get people's most people's confidence back. With regard to hospitality, and Robin, this relates a little bit to you with your restaurant clients, because you don't want to have these large groups together in the small room, in the small facilities. You know, rooftop lounges were a big item. They were never six feet apart in the rooftop. <laughs> they were one foot apart, okay? So where do you see 
the changes with regard to hospitality in the restaurant world and the hotel world? I think the restaurant world is going to have a, a quicker partial recovery. I mean, right now we're looking at the summer. You can do outdoor dining. De Blasio says he's going to close off some streets or open some sidewalks and maybe make sidewalk permits a little more accessible. But you have big restaurants with interior space, and you're not going to be able to seat 50% of the clientele. So unless you're not going to increase your, your hours of dining, you're not going to be able to keep the profits. And I think you're going to have some serious restaurant failures over the next year. If they've made it through the pandemic and are still alive, I think you're going to have to see some real changes to the restaurant rents. When you talk about restaurants, and I know this specifically, that Empire State uh, Malkin, when they built uh, one of the new steak restaurants on 37th Street, it was an amenity for the buildings. Today, we're going to see changes in way, the way people go to restaurants when they work. Just talking of the boxes, box lunches, and other types of situations. Do you see the white tablecloth restaurants hurting in this market? Much more different than the QSR type of restaurants and so on. Yeah, I, I absolutely think the white tablecloth restaurants are going to have a tough go of it. I think they're going to lose their volume of people. I think they're going to, uh, I think people aren't going to go out to lunch because it means taking the elevator down and the elevator back. And if buildings are going to schedule your arrival times and your departure times and limit their elevator use to four passengers per elevator, it's going to just become a nightmare to go to lunch. I would agree with that. I mean, we're, we're certainly in conversations with some of our, our restaurant tenants and the larger format restaurants, you know, they're not going to get that corporate business, you know, whether it's the corporate dinners or the weddings or the birthday parties and really the large groups that are driving a lot of their business. And uh, when you're going out and spending 50 bucks on the steak, that's not your typical kind of weekend family outing. So some of those restaurants will, um, will need to kind of work with their landlords on on a plan and some of the municipalities you know basically if, if you if you can use your side street we've seen some of our kind of white tablecloth restaurants start to start to set up tables so they'll offset some of that a loss but um you know it, it's it's hard to to see them be able to recover until um all is back to normal to, to full sales and, and they're all worried about their sales um as it relates to their rent here you are we have the lawyer we have the advisor we have the investors how do you take care of the restaurants and how do you take care of the retailers? What are the different ideas that you're going to do to handle your customers? And part of the rents were deferred based on the PPP money. So what 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 are you doing with regard to that, with regard to your clients and so on? Robin, Carrie, and everyone. Robin? Um, yes, I've been working on a lot of rent deferrals, both from the landlord standpoint and from the tenant standpoint. Most of the landlords are pretty practical. You can't get blood from a stone. And if they're really smart, they want to keep their tenants in place. They know that the tenants haven't been able to produce any business for the last period of three or four months. They don't see full capacity returning. So we're doing amendments to leases in which we're deferring either all of the rent, half the rent, the tenant just paying OPEX and taxes or CAM and taxes. And then they're moving the rent payments either extending the lease term or starting repayments in some cases in the fall or in a lot of cases starting in January in the hopes that there's either a cure or some sort of medication that people will take so that it won't be such a fatal outcome. My restaurant tenants though are actually, many of them are looking at closing up or renegotiating the rent entirely going forward. And, and that's a harder, a harder thing for a landlord to accept that their rents are going to go down. So I'm yeah. getting pushback on that. Well, and are they getting pushback from the lenders on that as well if they want to entertain those conversations? Yes, of course, because the lenders don't want to reduce their loan. Some cases they'll extend the term of the loan, but that's got to be a smaller bank. That can't be a CMBS loan or something, as you mentioned, a bigger building where it's a restaurant amenity and you have a, a professional, you know, you have a professional chef that's, that's a part of a major building development. Carrie, you know, you, you represent high net worth individuals. How are they looking at this world today? So our, our clients that are that um, fit into that bucket generally are owners, office buildings in New York City and up and down the East Coast. And what we are specifically doing is exactly what Robin said. We are working with our tenants to 
uh, negotiate deferrals. We are requiring that they share their, that they apply for the SBA loans and that they apply some of their funds. We're trying not to give 100% deferrals, but uh, working with the tenants to give us something so that they don't get used to uh, a complete 100% deferral. So, you know, pay what you can. And then we're working with them to either, you know, if it's, if it's a new tenant, then just defer the payments. If the lease is coming up in 2021 or 2022, let's extend and, and um, apply that deferred rent to some point in the future. Those tenants are great. And then there are some tenants clearly that are trying to get out of their leases and using coronavirus as an excuse. And we're working with them too. We're trying to play fair and we um, don't see that as a great excuse to get out of a lease. So. Larissa, over the last three months, even though we had the crisis, you closed on certain deals and certain transactions, CBRM investors. How are you looking at transactions today and also the other people, but specifically Larissa, how are your clients looking at different deals in underwriting, in vacancy, in operating expenses, and so on? Sure. It's obviously very different by asset class, and I think as with uh, any downturn, there is sort of a rush to durability of income and safe havens, and the U.S. will continue to be that space, certainly, um, even though we have this dislocation, and, and not every asset class is made equal. You know, we've seen that in the industrial space, there's been, uh, for good quality products, that, that's long-term lease um, to credit tenants. Um, there has not been that much cap rate movement, uh, certainly a little bit, um, but uh, generally within industrial, as well as I would say multifamily in, in strong markets and locations, um, the the bid ask spread is is pretty wide, where where buyers want um, certainly some concession, and sellers are not willing to really move. Um, and there are cases there there will be folks who will need to sell. Um, because they have an IRR clock or, or other considerations, um, so those deals will close. But obviously, there's been a, a slowdown in the market. Uh, people can't fly to, to do tours. They can't get due diligence done, and um, things will start to open up now that, that the country is opening up. Well, all of you represent clients and investors who are looking at, you know, defaulting debt. The defaults aren't taking place yet, okay? Many people believe they're default because basically the banks have allowed it to be kicked down the road for three to six months. Where do you see the situation when banks and when lenders and maybe even when CNBS will start sell their, selling their debt? Yeah, I was going to say this is a slow motion situation. I mean, the banks had a lot of legislative and political pressure to do not to to defer to extend whatever they needed for the next three months, six months. And so there was a huge amount of political pressure. And even if the tenant was in default in New York, the courts were closed. You're not going to, you're not going to change that. And I think that pricing on debt has moved from par essentially for most deals down to 85 ish cents on the dollar. And a lot of people aren't prepared to take that kind of discount because they have to have the reserves against it. Um, and it's, it, this stuff tends to go very slowly. So if people are going to start moving stuff off their balance sheet, I wouldn't expect it to happen at earliest until the end of the summer, um, if not into 2021. There's a lot of political pressure building to not send people into default and to work it out. And from the lessons of the 90s, you don't really want to sell under duress because their you know, pretend and extend worked quite well in 08. I can share a couple of statistics I, I have. Look, you know, prior to coronavirus, 0.25% of loans were in forbearance, and now it's over 8.5%, right? You have $3.8 trillion worth of debt outstanding today. Upcoming CMBS maturities, 168 billion maturities, of which 36% are retail and hospitality, right? Of Since 2017, 355 billion of CMBS loans were are out there and you know again that statistic 36 percent were retail and hospitality there's going to be a wall of maturities and since they're retail and hospitality it's going to happen and there will be opportunities there will be foreclosures there'll be restructurings but it's just a question of when and ha and how big that wall is going to be we have to go now we will return next week